Great to see a lot of friendly faces. It's like everybody I've ever met in my entire life in one, in one room. And I brought you to Detroit, which, uh, you know, the question that everyone asks, like, I can't wait to get to the second ERI Summit, but why did we choose Detroit? Well, first off, it looks exactly like that anywhere you look. So, uh, but it's not the most beautiful city. Uh, even a homer like me, I can't, uh, I can't even fake that it's the most beautiful city in the world. Uh, but it is most interesting, right? And I would stand behind that, right? So it's the most interesting because of its character, and it's the character of this city that's actually the perfect backdrop, right, for a major initiative like ERI. And so I'm gonna walk you through what that character is built on and explore that to explain why we're having an electronics conference in a very non-traditional uh, location. So the heart of the city, to me, right, is a small room in the Detroit Institute of Arts. It's got a mural by Diego Rivera, right, and it celebrates the innovation, right, and disruption, right, of engineers like Henry Ford when they created the uh, assembly line. First off, it's beautiful, right, even though it explores engineering and sort of hardcore uh, technical uh, facts. This is about the impact of disruption and engineering on all aspects of, of society, right? how people get along, the impacts on the environment, right? but it's actually right, part of the essence and the soul uh, of this city. The rest of the world actually got to experience right, that soul, that essence, uh, when we got into World War II. Right, we went from 19th in military industrial readiness. That was the Pentagon's own assessment, or the DOD's own assessment of uh, our ability to manufacture components. We were 19th right behind Portugal. Right? We created the arsenal of democracy. Everyone in this area, all over the country, but particularly this area because of its industrial might, right, shifted from commercial manufacturing to military manufacturing. There was a spirit of collaboration between the military, right, national security, and the commercial world, right, that the world had never seen. 660,000 660, Jeeps were manufactured within a one hour radius of Detroit. We made more tanks in one facility in Detroit than the, German, the entire country of Germany made throughout the war. Right? We made a manufacturing line so large that it produced planes, bombers, every 45 minutes. And no one had taken the commercial manufacturing capabilities that was producing a car every 52 seconds and applied it to military tech like this before. There was a spirit of collaboration right, that was forced upon us based on world events, but it ended up in dramatic capabilities. If you look, this is the Willow Run plant, right? When you land, you're really close, uh, at the airport, you're really close to the Willow Run plant. This is 3.5 square, uh, million square feet of factory. A million, or a, a mile wide, right, or a mile long. Raw goods come in one side, and a plane was, sput uh, uh, was created every 45 minutes. How this was created is actually an interesting story. The Ford execs went and watched the, how the military planes were being built. Right, they actually went to the Hughes facility and saw people with screwdrivers and rivets manufacturing on an open runway. Exquisite planes, great designs, actually as good a designs as existed in the world, but being manufactured out in the open, and every time the sun came up and the sun set, right, the, ch the dimensions changed, right, they wasn't reliable. What ended up happening is we had great planes that actually didn't work. They were always late. The contracts were never uh, fulfilled. The complexity of making these exquisite machines was too much for the way the military was doing business at the time. On their way home, they actually wrote on a napkin and said, you can do this better. You can apply the same techniques of mass manufacturing. It's just going to have to be done at a scale we've never seen before. 50, uh, 52 seconds for each car. Translated to a much more difficult task of 45 minutes uh, for each bomber. And that ended up having huge social impact as well. So everybody knows this you know, iconic picture. This is Rosie the Riveter. What people don't know is Rosie was a real person. Right? She moved from Kentucky to Detroit to be in the Willow Run plant. Right? And she represented an entire class uh, of people. And it's actually 
even more complex than uh, it gets uh, described when people talk about Rosie, right? These were people who were never given a chance in society being asked right, to fill the, ro the, the void that existed when we needed uh, this industrial might applied to uh, the military. We couldn't be stupid. We couldn't have our biases get in the way, right? We needed the best people, the best talent we had in this country applied to uh, these military uh, tasks. So what isn't talked about as much, some people know that story, the impact on commercial space actually was dramatic as well. By asking these incredibly hard questions, how do you create a plane every 45 minutes, you get pretty good uh, at the assembly line type technologies that they were applying. The manufacturing base was polished into uh, a juggernaut that impacted the commercial world for decades to come. The DOD has very hard problems, and when they ask the commercial world to satisfy those, right, the commercial world gets better, and the DOD world gets better simultaneously. So Detroit had its heyday. You know, GM was the largest car, um, largest company in the world at the time. They, uh, the big three, Chrysler and Ford and GM together, made beautiful cars. Right? They, they're still beautiful today. These are, these are works of art. But entropy does not like dominance, right? This pillar of strength that was built based on uh, this military capability working with the commercial world, right? It inevitably was going to be attacked from all sides. This is, an uh, this is the uh, uh, footage from a movie that was put out, right? Lamenting the fact right, that we were being invaded by foreign competition, right? VWs from the East Coast and Nissans from the West Coast and how can they possibly have these foreign cars driving on our, our streets? Literally, right, they say, this is what a road is supposed to look like, right? You know, harkening back to the good old days, and now look at this road, and there's actually checking off, like, you know, this is a foreign car, this is a foreign car, <laughs> right? So, you can imagine Detroiters took that really well, <laughs> right? So growing up in Detroit, you knew Right, that um, you know, things were changing, right? And fear and anger right, and blame overtook that innovative uh, spirit. I can say this as a Detroiter. Growing up here, right, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't all about uh, innovation and, and getting out ahead, right? They did really good at certain things, right? But they did lose that uh, dominant uh, position. They ended up chasing, right? They weren't innovating. Uh, at the rate they were in the past, but more importantly, commercial uh, um, tastes changed, and um, you know, basically, you ended up trying to lead from behind. Right? We had a disruption in the market, right, based on all sorts of world factors that you know we go into much more uh, details of. But ultimately, right, they ended up uh, having to chase competition instead of disrupt from the front and have the competition chase them. Well, guess what? Right? We are in that position right now. When I say we, we mean the U.S. electronics industry is in that same dominant position right, based on the legacy that we have been handed down from the likes of Carver Mead, Lynn Conway, Ivan Sutherland. Right? Everything that Mark just talked about has placed a huge burden on all of our backs, right, as we are the incumbents of the world when it comes to making the world's best electronics. The PCAST report at the end of the Obama administration, I think, did a very good job, right, of highlighting what that position uh, is, right? We have, right, two of the three major tool manufacturers, right? We've got the three large-scale EDA uh, companies. We've got the top integrated device manufacturer, right, and we've owned the fabulous design space uh, for years. Right? This is a position of strength, but like all pillars of strength, right, entropy right, attacks that pillar, right, and we are going to face changes in, in competition. The only way to stay ahead right, is to learn those lessons, right, which we just talked about, right, of leaning on innovation and disruption. So we're in Detroit, not to look at some of the negative stories, it's actually 
a good news story, there's this huge rebirth going on. I can tell you this because when we tried to schedule this meeting in Detroit, we actually had to go to our third choice, right, our third weekend, right, because there was a PGA event being held downtown Detroit and other major conferences being uh, held down here. This is a $1.4 billion skyscraper that's being uh, built as we speak in the old Hudson's, uh, uh, <clears throat> the old mall that we used to uh, go to uh, when I was a kid that's been barren for uh, over 20 to 30 years. It is now going to be uh, this major skyscraper. On the left here, this is the old train station, right, which sat dormant. It was actually you know, the embarrassment on the skyline for years that's now been purchased by Ford and is now becoming their uh, headquarters for self-driving cars. You see right, this rebirth of this uh, region, right, as I think they've learned many of the lessons required right, to participate and not fear right, that uh, all of the changes that were thrust upon it for so many uh, years. There's actually three unicorns right, for startups that are valued over a billion dollars in the last two years right, that have emerged from the Detroit region after two decades of actually not having uh, a startup reach that uh, plateau. If you go downtown, you'll see May, Mo May Mobility, one of the startups actually uh, shuttling people around in self-driving cars today driving through the streets uh, of Detroit. Something that actually surprised me is I didn't think we were even there with the uh, technology uh, already. Um, <clears throat> so GM is manufacturing their crews, uh, self-driving cars at scale, right? Back in actually my hometown of Lake Orion, Michigan, um, that is actually going on at a rate that I was surprised to learn about in terms of the, the number of systems that are uh, uh, cars that are actually being uh, manufactured. It goes on and on, right? This is a resurgent uh, region, right? And it's a great backdrop uh, for uh, ERI. And I hope you get this experience that as you come to a place that is not the most obvious place to host uh, an electronics conference. So we need to fight, right? This is the Joe Lewis uh, fist that you'll see downtown. We shouldn't be complacent. We do need to actually have that spirit of uh, a little feistiness uh, in us and a little bit of a of fight because there is change, there are changes going on, right, behind the scenes and in front of the scenes, right, where uh, we are going to have a very different industry in 10 years than we do today. So this is the last time that we should be uh, complacent, but that fight needs to be channeled in the right direction, right? Instead of looking at Joe Lewis's fist, we should look at the spirit of Detroit, the other iconic statue that's part of our uh, landscape here. We need to look back right, at the lessons of Ford right, and Rivera in that mural, the power and disruption of, of innovation and engineering uh, for disruption. We need to learn the lessons of the collaboration between the commercial world and the national security landscape. Right? the lessons that were taught to us through the arsenal uh, of democracy. We need to learn le the lessons of Rosie the Riveter, right? We need to include everybody who can contribute to uh, advancing electronics, regardless of where you were born, right? Regardless, right, of your background, we need to tap into the talent that exists in this country to make us progress forward. Right? We need to make sure we aren't taking that fight, right, and making it, uh, making decisions based on fear, right? Fear, anger, and frustration, right, lead to defensive measures. We will have lots of defensive measures in place, right, but we need a forward stance. We need an innovation first stance, and that's what ERI is all about, right? ERI is not a series of programs. It's not even an, initi an initiative. ERI is a movement. It's a movement asking the community what they can do to advance the ball fast enough that you don't have to lean on those defensive and restrictive measures. We believe in everything, everybody here, right, that we can invent fast enough, right, that we can recreate the electronics industry in the face of competition around uh, the globe so that we don't have to lean on the more destructive measures. So I've done my part. 
it's been eight years and it's been a great run. I've loved getting to know everybody here. It's been the honor of a lifetime to be able to lead both the program managers and through the program managers, the electronics community that we, we have here. I step off the stage literally and figuratively and hand the reins to Mark and Jay. They are going to do an incredible job. But more importantly, we hand the reins to the community. This is your opportunity. You get to wake up every day and think, I get to be part of the positive response. And the better I do at my job, right, the better the country is going to be, but the better the globe is going to be, the better the, the world is going to be. And that is right, the opportunity of a lifetime. Thank you.